As the sun crests over an unassuming forest, vile creatures of the daylight begin to rise. Swarming tiny things, things you could hold in the palm of your hand, but things to be feared nonetheless. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D or other fantasy tabletop games and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be talking about a creature that is a first in more ways than one for me on this channel. Today's creature comes to us from the world of Penumbra, a spin-off tabletop game that uses the 3.5 core system created by Atlas Games that takes place in a dark fantasy world. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there inspiration wise, so if you like the sound of today's creatures, I definitely recommend checking it out. Special thanks goes to Cody Barton for recommending not only this creature, but the setting to me in general. And this also marks what is possibly the lowest CR creature I have ever covered. Because as I've said in the past, it's difficult to find creatures that are of low CR that are also interesting enough to even warrant having me do a conversion to fifth edition of them. But these creatures definitely make it onto that very small and limited list. The Seedkin are a collection of three different creatures that range from CR 1 half to CR 1. They're essentially tiny spider-sized sentient plants that will literally choke the life out of their quarry, have a horrific way of propagating, and of course have the ability to dominate and control some of their victims. I think these creatures make a great addition to any fantasy setting, and they're also very cool in the fact that they're plants because we don't have a ton of very unique plants in D&D 5th edition either. And what's so neat about a creature like this that comes to us at CR 1 quarter up to to CR1 is that against a low level party they can be used as a serious threat and against a high level party in great numbers they can be used as a hazard. But we'll get more into that as we move along because today I'm going to talk to you about just what these creatures can do in battle and of course we'll go over some plot hooks and ways that you can implement them into your game and your world. But first things first make sure you grab your favorite FDA approved weed killer because it is time for... So as I mentioned, the seed kin comes in three different varieties and we're going to cover each one of them one at a time and go over what makes them unique. First up is the creepers and no, not those kind of creepers. I have a feeling this setting predates Minecraft by a little bit. The creeper is the most general and abundant type of seed kin. They essentially provide the baseline for what our other subtypes build on. They are tiny in size, which sets the precedent for all of these creatures because all three versions are in fact tiny and the creepers only have a move speed of 20 feet. That is actually pretty fast for a creature who is tiny, but they're not going to be able to keep up with most other creatures in the world. Their main attack is called Grasping Tendrils, and this is simply a melee attack that they can hit a creature up to five feet away with, and what it seeks to do is latch onto them and choke the life out of them. So it does a bit of bludgeoning damage, and the creature becomes automatically grappled. Once that creature is grappled, it's going to then seek to use its bite attack, which does a little bit more damage, but also has the side effect of possibly poisoning the target. And that is ultimately it, about what you'd expect from a CR1 quarter creature. They provide the very important service of just kind of making up the bulk and providing the front line of what these creatures basically are, which is a swarm of spider-sized plant monsters. So pretty straightforward, but things start to get it really interesting when we move on to our first subtype, which are called spawners. They essentially have the same base stats, but with a few minor and very important tweaks. Their move speed goes up to 30, meaning that they can keep up with most party members. Damn you monks. And they also have a little bit more HP, so they're a bit higher on the survivability scale. And as their name would suggest, the spawners are responsible for carrying around the seed pods that ultimately lead to the way that these creatures propagate, and it is pretty horrific. This creature possesses an action called Release Seed Pod, and it does exactly what it sounds like. It releases the seed pod onto a creature that it has grappled. That creature and all other creatures within 5 feet, aside from other seedkin of course, have to make a constitution save. If they fail, they become infected by a number of seeds equal to a d10 roll plus 5. Once they become infected by these seeds, they don't even realize it. Nothing happens at first. Behind the screen, you as the DM are going to roll a d4, and that will determine how many days this infection is going to take before it manifests. So let's say you roll your d4 and you come up with a 4. Great. So three days go by after the party's encounter with the Seedkin, and nothing's really happened so far. They've probably honestly forgotten about it by this point. But towards the beginning of the third day, any players who failed that constitution save and were infected 
are now starting to show some peculiar signs of infection. Their skin is starting to break out in these large hives and almost like boils. If they have a paladin in their party or a cleric, or they just have access to the remove disease spell or anything of equal power, if that is cast on them, the infection simply goes away and that's the end of it. However, if nothing is done, on the beginning of the fourth day, as the sun begins to rise, those boils and postules and all the gross little things covering that person's body begin to burst open and a new batch of seedkin is born. The newly born seedkin just erupt out of that creature, causing 1d4 damage per seed that was embedded under their skin, and then they begin to mature within seconds. To a lower level character, this is a potential death sentence if they're not lucky with how the rolls turn out. To a higher level character, this is still pretty harmful and it's also disgusting and is also possibly the worst way to start out your day. Because now they're not only wounded, and potentially multiple party members might be wounded, but they also have about a dozen or so seed can they're gonna have to deal with and fight them all over again. One of which is guaranteed to be another spawner. And that brings us to our third variety of this creature called the Slaver. The final and most deadly version of the Seedkin makes that big leap from CR 1 half to CR 1. It's got significantly more hit points and a bit higher AC. They do lose that seed pot ability because they are not the seeders, they have no way of propagating their kind, however they are the ones who are essentially running the show. They can communicate telepathically up to a mile away with any creature, and they don't even need to be able to speak the same language as that creature. They simply communicate via empathic link, or if you wanted to as a DM you could rule that they can just speak whatever language the creature they're making the mental link with speaks. However you decide to do that, they can communicate. And any seedkin that they can make mental contact with, within that mile radius, are automatically brought under their control so they have total domination over potentially hundreds of their kind. They also gain an ability called Control Host. And believe it or not, these creatures get even more freaky from here on in and even more dangerous. If the slaver has a creature grappled at the beginning of its turn, it can then use its tendrils and kind of bore them into that creature's neck, causing a bit of damage and injecting them with some sap. Not just any sap, but slaver seedkin sap. If the seedkin creeper is still grappling that creature at the start of its next turn, that creature then must make a wisdom save, and if it fails, it is put under the effect of a permanent suggestion spell that is of course being controlled by the Seedkin Slaver. And this isn't quite as powerful as a domination spell, it's not going to be able to force the creature it's enslaving to kill its friends or jump off a cliff or anything like that, but it's going to be able to control its actions and make it say and do certain things as long as they're not totally outside of the realm of what it might possibly normally do. And over a long period of time, these subtle suggestions can pretty much shape it, the actions and the way a creature totally behaves. Now against party members, this is obviously quite effective if it can get it off. It's going to take a total of three rounds before this thing can actually take over a player, so it's not like it's going to be a huge threat, especially if the party knows about it ahead of time because they're going to want to kill that thing before they contend with anything else. But where things start to get really interesting here is how this creature interacts with NPCs. So let's talk about some... So let's just say you plan out an adventure with an evil group of druids. For whatever reason, they want this town or village or city destroyed. Maybe this city has become a stain on the natural world, or maybe they just don't like the people who live there. Whatever reason you decide to come up with, this group of druids wants this city gone. What better way to do that than to use a slaver, possibly under the control of one of the druids in this circle, to take over and mentally control the mayor of a town or whatever powerful political figure you choose. This person could then enact all kinds of crazy policies or make all these big changes or huge decisions that didn't benefit the people and eventually caused some kind of revolution. So the druids don't actually have to get involved at all, they can just sit back and watch the city tear itself apart and then go in and destroy whatever's left once the revolution is over. And then of course it comes down to our party to solve the mystery, stop the evil druids, and destroy a whole lot of seedkin along the way. Or an example actually mentioned by the book is using these creatures as a tool of assassination. See the thing about seedkin is they go totally dormant at night. 
they actually die in total darkness. So if they're covered by a zone of like say a darkness spell or are left underground where there's absolutely zero light, they will wither away and die. In regular darkness though, such as just being inside during the evening or under the night sky, whatever the case is, as there happens to be pretty consistent darkness even in the natural world, they simply go dormant. They just curl up into tiny little balls of grass or whatever and go to sleep essentially. So something the book mentions that these creatures have been used for is an assassination tool where an assassin will get their hands on some seedkin, leave them underneath the creature's bed that they're trying to assassinate, and then as soon as that creature comes back into their room with any significant light source, such as a hooded lantern or something like that, the seedkin then awaken and attack that person. So maybe there's a member of your party that someone, such as a druid or an assassin who has connections with a druid or just anyone you decide really, that's able to get their hands on some seedkin, decides to use them and to try to kill one of the party members. And then of course the party has to fight them off. Or I mean, it's also possible that this is happening to an NPC the party's protecting, or maybe even someone not even related to the party, but then a seedkin infestation breaks out in town and the party has to then try to stop it. It could be a whole like body snatcher situation where the slavers are taking over and trying to remain inconspicuous while the regular seedkin are just kind of wreaking havoc across the town. And of course, it's always possible to go down the route where some druid mistakenly summoned seedkin and didn't really realize what they were doing or that they were summoning something so dangerous, thinking it was just like any other plant creature. And then that druid goes to the party for help, trying to contain this outbreak that they inadvertently caused. If they're successful, maybe they'll have an up and coming druid on their side as some kind of NPC ally. And of course, having an NPC who is potentially powerful and indebted to you is never a bad thing. Anyways, that is all for today's video. I really like these creatures and hopefully you do as well. I think there's a place for them in pretty much any game, no matter how far removed it is from nature, just because of what these creatures are like. Unless you've played in this setting before, it's very unlikely you've had these creatures used against you. But if you have played in the Penumbra setting or you just have had a creature like this used against you and you wanna tell me about it, please do so in the comments below or if you just have plans on how you want to use these creatures, please leave a comment down there as well because I know myself and all the other DMs out there enjoy borrowing ideas from some of the brilliant ones that we see drop in the comments down there. And as always, if you go in the description below, you will see a link to the stat block for this creature that will give you everything you need to run it as is. And of course, if you're one of my lovely patrons, you will find a link to the premium style monster manual-esque stat block that I make every week for my patrons posted there as well. In addition to all that fun stuff, you can find all the social media things. If you want to holler at me on Twitter, join the Discord community, all that good stuff, you know where to go. In any case, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate it. And that is all for this week. I will see you in the next video. Till then. 